Arnold Rothstein, the leader of New York's Jewish underworld, was not a street gangster, but a refined gambler recognized as a pioneer in organized crime in the United States. For 20 years, he symbolized high-stakes gambling and large sums of money rather than a conventional life in finance. He accumulated his initial fortune by betting on anything, cards, horses, even election results. He considered himself a phenomenal gambler, a man who knew how to create his own luck and ensure it was always in his favor. It was a matter of ego. He simply wanted to outsmart everyone around him, whether at the racetrack or the gambling house. This was a lucrative philosophy, and by 1912, before turning 30, he had already amassed his first million. To the general public, Arnold Rothstein is a gangster about whom little is known. His name usually comes up only when discussing mobsters like Meyer Lansky or Lucky Luciano, who mention Rothstein as their mentor and investor, but this is just the first layer of the story. Arnold Rothstein, a multifaceted personality and Jewish businessman who would later be called the Brain and the Great Banker, was not an immigrant. His grandfather had arrived in America in the mid-19th century, and his father was born in America. Therefore, his family had already gone through the stages of adaptation and poverty before Arnold was born in 1882. His parents, Abraham and Esther Rothstein, lived in New York and were typical Orthodox Jews who honored the culture and religion of their ancestors and tried to instill the same perspective in their children. Ironically, Arnold's father was a successful merchant with an impeccable reputation and such solid business practices that he earned the nickname Rothstein the Just. Although Abraham managed to support his entire family comfortably and was a successful businessman, he could not give enough attention to each child, or so it seemed to Arnold, who developed an extremely selfish and jealous attitude. From a young age, the future great banker hated his older brother and believed he always got the best and the most. Arnold shifted the blame for his feelings onto his family dynamics. This discontent gradually turned into teenage rebellion. Arnold was extremely reluctant to study in the Jewish religious school. The only subject he valued there was mathematics. In other classes, his main goal was to devise schemes to avoid learning anything and to outsmart the teachers. It was clear that Rothstein wouldn't last long in the traditional religious educational system. Alongside playing pranks and manipulating his teachers, Arnold began to gamble a pursuit that combined his two main passions at the time, his love for numbers and his rebellion against his father's perspective. After all, gambling was strictly prohibited in Jewish religious teachings. However, in New York during those years, there was no strict prohibition against such activities for those who wanted to try their luck. In fact, one could say that the Big Apple of the late 19th and early 20th centuries was like Sodom and Gomorrah, where gambling was one of the most prominent vices. Innocent of the sins exhibited there due to the fact that criminals and authorities were intertwined like lovers who hadn't seen each other in years, the streets of New York were an explosive mix of brothels, drug dens, and gambling establishments, all seasoned with corrupt police officers and politicians and adorned by the early forms of organized crime. The wave of outrage over the decline in morality was just beginning to gain momentum. There was no prohibition on drugs, no prohibition on alcohol, and power was often obtained not by persuasion but by coercion, bribery, and fraud. It was no surprise that officials not only gladly covered up dark deeds but often owned the brothels or gambling houses themselves. It was a time when dark and shady money-making activities continued in broad daylight. In such a world, even teenagers like the young Rothstein could easily find places to place a bet. Arnold frequented local bookies, and since he was not held back by strict parental oversight, he was free to indulge in his passion for gambling. Because he wasn't allowed inside due to his age, Arnold would try to catch the attention of people inside to place bets on his chosen horse. More often than not, he was successful, and having made a bet, would wait impatiently outside for the race to end. Gambling became illegal in New York in 1910 when the state enacted laws that prohibited and penalized various forms of betting and gambling. These anti-gambling laws were implemented as part of a broader national movement aimed at addressing concerns about corruption and the social problems associated with gambling. However, despite the prohibition, Underground gambling activities and illegal betting continued to flourish in the city's underworld. 
This environment contributed to the rise of organized crime, and figures like Arnold Rothstein thrived in this clandestine scene. By the second decade of the 20th century, Rothstein had ascended in the criminal world and moved to the district of in the Tenderloin District of New York, the entertainment and red light district at the heart of Manhattan, Arnold Rothstein opened a luxurious gambling parlor called Glenny, generating over $10,000 a week in profits, equivalent to nearly $200,000 today. By 1919, Rothstein was a multimillionaire with properties that included nightclubs, gambling resorts, and brothels. In New York, he was called The Brain, the man who never loses at the card table or in business. By 1919, with a substantial fortune amassed, Rothstein seemed able to buy his way out of any situation, even after shooting New York police officers. Despite this, he was so powerful that he went unpunished for shooting at the police. In court, Rothstein used his influence to skew the odds in his favor. He had friends in the judicial system, bribed police officers and judges, and used bribes to control witnesses. They were either paid to stay silent or other methods were used to ensure their silence. At that time, Rothstein was a dominant force in the criminal underworld. Arnold Rothstein realizes that the players are ready to be corrupted. He sets out to bribe them to lose. Secretly, he approaches the players and eight of them agree to fix key games. This was a way to get back at Comiskey by sabotaging the World Series and making some money. Since the White Sox were clear favorites, the odds against their rivals were high. Rothstein placed heavy bets on the Cincinnati Reds to win the World Series, betting every cent he had and spreading the bets across the country to avoid suspicion. At first, Rothstein's scheme appears successful. The White Sox lose the initial games, granting the Reds a series lead. However, come the fifth game, the players grow furious. Rothstein's agreement promised immediate cash payment, yet all his funds are locked in bets. Feeling deceived, the players believe Rothstein is playing them for fools and revolt against him. With a sense of betrayal, they resolve to win and claim their rightful share of the prize money, ultimately becoming champions of the World Series and turning the tables on those who had initially betrayed them. A star pitcher in Game 8 is a guy named Claude Lefty Williams, and he's determined to play to win. If Lefty isn't being paid to win or lose, he'll play for the prize money instead. But if the White Sox win the series, Rothstein will be finished, and he can't let that happen. His millions have been made through scams and bribes, and now, being smart, Rothstein is about to cross a line that will lead him into the realm of gangsterism by resorting to violence. On the night before Game 8, tensions are at their peak. Lefty Williams and his wife go for a walk to relax. The story goes that he was approached by a man on the street who told him that if he knows what's good for him and his wife, he will lose that game and lose it early. The next day, the White Sox face the Cincinnati Reds. Everything depends on this game. The threat works. Lefty and his teammates deliver an easy victory to the Reds. In New York, Rothstein receives the news. The White Sox have lost, and Rothstein makes millions. The brain has executed the greatest sports manipulation in American history. However, the collapse of the White Sox is so dramatic that the U.S. government smells something suspicious. While the series is underway, something seems off and people begin to talk, providing confessions to prosecutors and newspapers. Everything begins to unravel and fingers point to Arnold Rothstein. It's 1919. And here are the main players in the investigation of the recently concluded World Series. Rothstein is one step ahead. Before being accused, he voluntarily goes to Chicago and presents himself before a grand jury as an innocent victim. Perhaps money changed hands directly, and it was truly a masterful job manipulating the grand jury. Probably more so than fixing the World Series itself. Once again, he has manipulated the odds, and the case against Rothstein collapses, along with the reputation of the White Sox. The public's perception of Rothstein is shattered. He's seen as the man who corrupted America's favorite sport. However, not everyone is unimpressed. Rothstein is now on the radar of the disorganized group leading New York street gangs. What matters most isn't what he did, but what people think he did. This suggests that the power of gangsters is equal to that of the government, a turning point for Rothstein. 
The millionaire now has friends in low places and wastes no time recruiting them. Rothstein has his fortune from fixing matches burning a hole in his pocket. So when the United States declares prohibition in 1920, he sees a lucrative new business opportunity. As prohibition is enforced across the country, the nation remains thirsty for alcohol. Disorganized gangs of Italian-American and Jewish-American gangsters rush to sell diluted liquor to the poor. But the brain thinks bigger. If he can organize the gangsters and sell alcohol on a larger scale nationally, he can make a lot of money. He was the first to recognize the money that could be made from smuggling alcohol and organized the first idea of how to run smuggling as a business. Rothstein isn't interested in selling cheap liquor on street corners. He has class. He knows the real money is in selling expensive Scotch whiskey to the wealthy. He imports the finest goods from Scotland, doesn't tamper with it, and sells it to the best clientele, establishing a reputation as the top provider of quality products. First, he contacts Scotch distillers abroad and then organizes the shipment of the goods, bribing officials to introduce the liquor into the country. All he needs now are men to distribute it. His team will forever change American crime. Arnold Rothstein is the mentor of the entire wave of future gangsters, those we know as the classic gangsters of all time. Meyer Lansky, Bugsy Siegel, Frank Costello, and even Lucky Luciano himself had something to do with all of them. In the 1920s, Rothstein takes these young, smart thugs and shows them that if they want to succeed, crime must operate like a business. One of his protégés, Lucky Luciano, would lead the five families of New York, another, Meyer Lansky, the future accountant of the Mafia, and he places his bets on a young, violent thug named Dutch Schultz. He carefully selects the cream of the criminal crop and allows these young Turks to run wild and do as they please. And that's where these guys start. Rothstein provides the cash and never gets his hands dirty while the young Turks learn to turn small-scale violence into big business. For these gang of thugs, it's the opportunity of a lifetime. Regardless of what's said about many of these gangsters, they realize Rothstein was something special, far above them. If they want to make money and have connections to avoid trouble with the law, Rothstein was the guy. And so begins the greatest smuggling operation in American history, with routes all over the country flowing with Rothstein's high-quality liquor. The brain takes more than a healthy cut, and in today's money, he soon has an estimated worth of $125 million. Rothstein has gone from being a high-stakes gambler to the richest thief in the country, with refined tastes to match. He's the only gangster who can pass for a gentleman, speaking and dressing in a very middle-class and business-like manner. He wants to build his team in his own image, teaching Luciano good taste in how to use cutlery and how to assist a lady to her seat at dinner by pulling out her chair. He's not just the mentor of Lucky Luciano in the crime business, but also in the fashion business, turning a cheap gangster from the Lower East Side into a model for the Mafia. He also gives these boys a sense of personal improvement, they should have better vocabulary and important touch. This is the future of organized crime, acting as businessmen, not just muscle. Rothstein can also provide valuable lessons in public relations, while Luciano works partly as an enforcer and drug trafficker for the Sicilian Mafia bosses. In June 1923, he's caught in a police trap selling drugs on Manhattan's 14th Street. Unlike Rothstein, Luciano can't bribe his way out of trouble. Instead, he saves his own skin and betrays some wanted mafiosos to the police. He strikes a deal with the police, snitching on some of his associates and escapes. Now, Luciano has two problems. His high-class clients don't want to be associated with a street drug dealer from 14th Street, and his gangster associates don't want to be associated with a snitch. Luciano escapes jail, but the incident tarnishes his reputation. In his hour of need, he turns to Rothstein for help and asks him how he can restore his good name. Arnold tells Luciano to buy 200 of the best front-row tickets for the fight between Jack Dempsey and Luis Firpo. You're witnessing one of the wildest fights ever seen in the professional boxing ring. 85,000 fans are screaming to see Jack Dempsey and Luis Firpo exchange blows in one of the most frenetic fights of the century. 
Despite the high cost of the tickets, Rothstein tells Luciano to give them away to the most influential people in the United States. Luciano distributes them to wealthy businessmen, important congressmen, and gangsters like Al Capone and Johnny Torrio. To top it off, Luciano appears at the fight dressed elegantly. Luciano's reputation is restored, and everyone wants to meet him, all thanks to his public relations man, Arnold Rothstein. Rothstein taught Luciano and other future members of the Organized Crime Hall of Fame how to function, operate, and be cunning non-violently. Arnold knew they couldn't succeed in American crime by being violent alone. He considered them misfits who would eventually be discovered. The key to success, and to dying in your own bed if you could, was to be organized, intelligent, and astute. His influence was so great in the New York underworld that he was called upon to mediate gang wars, earning himself another nickname, The Judge. He charged extremely high fees for these services, and it's reported that after resolving a territorial war, he sent a bill of $500,000 to two gang leaders who paid it as a show of respect for the man who saved them time and loss of income. Rothstein helps gangsters in other ways, acting as an illegal bank and offering credit to criminals to start their own illicit businesses. He's the number one, the big man, the great capitalist, the guy who ties it all together. If you want a deal to work, you see him. But once again, the player who never bets shortens the odds. His loans come with strict conditions. Gangsters must take out life insurance policies with Rothstein as the beneficiary. If they can't pay their debt, he cashes in their insurance. His generosity comes at a high price, a 20% interest rate. And if they don't pay, he feels he owns them and they may owe him certain favors he doesn't want to do personally. Gradually, Rothstein is taking control of the criminal underworld of New York and can call in favors whenever he wants. But funding the mafia affects his finances, and soon, the brain needs another source of income. He ventures into what will become a gold mine for the future mafia, labor racketeering. In 1926, labor unrest is rampant, and bosses pay good money to pressure their workers not to strike. Rothstein connects with Louis Bacalter, a violent gangster who cracks heads for factory bosses. A truly vicious character from the Lower East Side and a complete animal, a thug of thugs. But even tough guys like Louis are slaves to big business. They only get paid when there's a strike. The brain, as always, teaches him how to shorten the odds. Under Rothstein's protection, Louis takes control of an entire union. However, there are sometimes drawbacks to having pupils, and one pupil in particular proves to be problematic. Arnold Rothstein's protégé is a guy named Arthur Simon Flegenheimer, better known as Dutch Schultz. Rothstein gave Dutch Schultz his start as a bootlegger, but now he wants to act on his own. Schultz is one of those guys who won't be pigeonholed, who will use force, who is an unreserved killer. Rothstein allows Schultz to distribute illegal beer in the Bronx, but it's not enough. With a group of thugs at his disposal, Schultz starts hijacking Rothstein's liquor deliveries. When Rothstein hears the news, he dismisses the rebellion and simply has his squad of thugs eliminate Schultz's top soldiers, forcing him to back off. After all, Schultz was a psychopath. But more importantly, the brain can see that Prohibition's days are numbered, and one of his other protégés has opened the door to a business that will make liquor trafficking seem insignificant. In its early days, Charles Lucky Luciano started as a drug trafficker. And now he talks to Rothstein about the unprecedented demand on the streets. Rothstein, being the brain, sees a market he can capitalize on. Before Arnold Rothstein, the drug trade was extremely disorganized. But with his intelligence, cash, and connections, any enterprise he backed would thrive exponentially. He supplies the merchandise to cities across the country, catering to both the rich and the poor. He knew how to keep his hands clean by organizing distribution through third parties, but it's not enough. He wants to take his criminal empire beyond the United States, but for that, he needs backing even richer than him. In 1928, he meets with the third richest man in the world, European financier Captain Lowenstein. He has the money to do it, and to form an incredible drug trafficking cartel. Together, they devise a plan for an international drug ring. The captain can provide connections in Europe, and Arnold can provide connections in America. Everything is going smoothly. 
The flow of illegal drugs is about to increase tenfold, and Rothstein is about to enrich himself beyond his wildest dreams. Then, on the 4th of July, his new business partner, Captain Lowenstein, mysteriously disappears. While aboard his private plane, he gets up to go to the bathroom, and the plane lands without him. No one knows how to get out, but we know this. If he had lived and partnered with Arnold Rothstein, the flow of illegal drugs into the United States would have multiplied astonishingly. The catastrophic news of the captain's disappearance reaches Rothstein in New York. With Lowenstein out of the game, his dreams of an international drug empire fade away, and after heavily investing, it hurts him where it hurts the most, his capital. The collapse of the drug deal is just the beginning. Soon, more investments crumble. Arnold Rothstein, who was 46 years old and owned Broadway as well as most of the city, suddenly experienced something strange. The man who had the Midas touch couldn't win anymore, no matter what. He lost hundreds of thousands of dollars in horse races, and his businesses also began losing money. R's luck is changing, and as a gambler, that's the last thing you want. He's surrounded by increasingly worse and more dangerous people. Gangsters trained in organized crime are out of control. Luciano finds himself embroiled in a deadly feud between two Italian criminal families, a bloody power struggle that will claim the lives of dozens of gangsters. And the sadistic Dutch Schultz is now the most feared man in New York. In this tumultuous world of gangsters, Arnold Rothstein operates as a lone wolf. He truly was a gangster without a gang, someone who was like a portfolio manager, bringing different deals from different people in different moments without the protection of a crew. Rothstein becomes paranoid. There's a sense in New York that perhaps the great capitalist has had his day. He starts losing money on the track and in high-stakes poker games. Suddenly, the great capitalist has major trouble keeping his payments and finances in order. In September 1928, involved in a high-stakes poker game, he lost an estimated $320,000. It had to be rigged. There's no way I, Arnold Rothstein, could lose that amount of money in the gangster world. Calling someone a cheat is a big deal. Rothstein crosses the line. He treats George McManus, a well-known and connected gambler, as if he's nothing. Adding insult to injury, he refuses to pay, and this turns out to be his riskiest bet of all. Over the next two months, he continues to lose large sums of money. With the presidential elections around the corner, he bets half a million dollars that Herbert will win. On election day, November 4th, 1928, but that same night, he receives a call to meet someone in a room at the Park Sheraton Hotel. In that mysterious encounter, Rothstein is gravely wounded. He was shot around 10.15 p.m. as he staggered out of the service elevator, clutching his stomach. Seriously injured, he managed to reach the sidewalk and then collapsed while clinging to life. Police arrived at the hospital and pleaded with him to tell them who had shot him, but he put his finger to his lips, the sign of Omerta, and refused to tell the police anything. Two days later, on November 6, 1928, the great Arnold Rothstein, the king of the Roaring Twenties, died from his wounds. On his deathbed, unknowingly, he correctly chose Herbert Hoover as the president-elect. Rothstein was buried in an Orthodox Jewish ceremony. The shocking thing about Arnold Rothstein's death is that no one would think such a thing possible. But it was, and it happened. A question is on everyone's lips. Who killed Arnold Rothstein? The list of suspects is long, with the obvious candidate being George McManus, the man to whom Rothstein owed thousands of dollars. Although McManus is later arrested, he is acquitted. There are countless people who could have wanted him dead for one reason or another. There's Rothstein's protege, Lucky Luciano, now a major drug trafficker who could inherit the entire drug business. Or perhaps it was Dutch Schultz, who had long been vying for Rothstein's bootlegging empire. Then there's Louis Bacolta, the violent labor blackmailer. The list of suspects goes on. Incredibly, no one is ever convicted of the crime. Despite Rothstein being worth millions, his money was never found. Ten years after his death, and after countless hours of searching for his largest holdings, his brother finally declared bankruptcy. Just months after Rothstein's death, suspects gathered in Atlantic City. If there was ever a true conspiracy, this was it. 
They met in an elegant hotel, marking the largest gathering of the Mafia in United States history. And all those who had dealings with Rothstein were there. But the truth of who was responsible for his demise remains shrouded in mystery. With Arnold Rothstein gone, everyone wants to know what happens next. The king is dead. Who will replace him? Who could replace a man who rigged the 1919 World Series, financed bootlegging, and pioneered the modern drug trade in the United States? Arnold Rothstein made waves in the underworld empire of the 1920s. They didn't know what to do when he was gone, but they knew one thing. They would never forget him. The men whom Rothstein taught and molded in the ways of organized crime are ready to take over his empire. They are poised to quickly seize control and divide the various illicit businesses he was involved in. Louis and Lucky Luciano will continue to expand the drug trade in the United States. If you enjoyed Arnold Rothstein's underworld story, then you should watch the story of Charles Lucky Luciano, one of his greatest protégés, who would be considered one of the most influential gangsters of the century, for better or for worse, in the United States. You have his video right on the screen now. As we wrap up this journey through the captivating tales of underworld legends, let's take a moment to reflect on the intricate webs spun by figures like Arnold Rothstein. Their stories not only shed light on the dark side of history, but also remind us of the complexities of human nature. Join us next time as we delve deeper into the lives of infamous figures and explore the untold stories that shaped our world. Don't forget to like, share and subscribe to stay updated on all our latest episodes. Until next time, keep exploring, keep learning and keep questioning. Thanks for watching.